June 23rd, where we get to gather together as, as two boards and have, have some terrific discussions. So thanks for everybody for making time to be here today. I want to uh, first state by saying our chairman, Mr. Brandon, is running a little behind with some traffic, but he'll be here shortly. But we wanted to get started in the interest of everyone's time. So let's turn it over to our, to our colleague on the school board, Mr. Our chairman, Mr. Roscoe Cooper, for a few words. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Again, we're excited to be here to share this dialogue with our peers on the Board of Supervisors. And we're appreciative of the community for not only being present, but also participating via online. So, um, Mr. Vice Chairman, thank you again um, for your warm welcome. We look forward to a good meeting. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. At this time, we'll get right into the agenda. I'll turn it over to our manager, Mr. Patokas, and our superintendent, Ms. Cashwell. Dr. Cashwell, thank you for being here. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, members of the school board, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, three topics to you uh, this afternoon. For the members of the audience, the uh, school board and board typically meet uh, once a year to discuss the annual operating and capital budget. There have been prior retreats uh, in the past where once a year the boards will get together and talk about um, the annual work plan, if you will, for the year. But the last time um, that the school board and the board got together for a joint work session was actually, I believe, in the uh, spring of 2018 before uh, Dr. Cashwell joined our county. And out of that work session came a number of outcomes that resulted in additional funding for um, our schools, uh, namely teacher supports and the uh, pay scale that we are looking to augment for uh, teachers. But this, uh, this afternoon, we have three topics for both boards' consideration. Uh, I do want to note that the Board of Supervisors does have a meeting that starts at 7 p.m., and so we will need to be leaving um, at 6.45 in order to make that meeting. But the three topics are a discussion on the School Resource Officer Program, that will be led by Lieutenant Colonel Linda Tony, as well as Courtney Berry from our schools. Uh, then Dr. Cashwell will present uh, some information on reopening and what that looks like for our school system. And finally, Megan Coates from Finance uh, will present some information augmented by Chris Sorensen and Lenny Pritchard from the school system to the speakers, to our folks. I am going to ask you that you uh, be as brief as possible because what this afternoon is about is about dialogue between these two elected bodies. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Lieutenant Colonel Linda Tony uh, to come forward and present information on the School Resource Officer Program. Thank you. It is truly an honor to be here. Courtney here with our partnership here with schools, but Mr. Brandon, I know you're not here yet, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Board of Supervisors, Reverend Cooper, Chairman, nice to see you, members of the school board, Mr. Manager, Dr. Cashwell, thank you for having us. Um, there's several things I'm going to talk to you about, and again, I'll try to be brief, but it's a very passionate topic for me. I've been blessed to be with Henrico County Police for 28 years, and 25 of those years I have somehow been connected to our schools. And it started when I was a school resource officer who taught the D.A.R.E. program 25 years ago. And throughout the time that I've been with the division, I've also been a supervisor within our school resource officer program. So when I talk to you about some of the history, there's also some personal experience and things that have helped shape and mold the person that I am and the passion that I have for this topic. My understanding is that each one of the board members, that you all have a timeline. We're not going to go through that entire timeline. My understanding is that you have a handout that will show you some specific things, but to highlight a few things that are there in your timeline. In 1976, the Henrico School Liaison Program was implemented, and at that time, there was juvenile investigators that worked, and they worked with some um, diversion programs within the schools. In 1986, Henrico County started teaching the, DARE, teaching the DARE program, Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program, and for many kids who might be listening, they can probably still recite that song to you that they learned when they were in DARE. And uniform officers taught crime prevention lessons to students in elementary school. In 1995, uniform officers joined the juvenile investigators as what we called school liaison officers. 
and in 1999, the school liaison program transitioned to what we know now as a school resource officer program with one SRO at each middle school, one SRO at each one of our high schools. Currently, here in year 2020, we have 35 officers that are assigned to our schools. Our school resource officers work in partnership every single day with our school staff, our students, and our parents to ensure that the school campus is a safe place to learn. What a top priority that we all have to have our children be safe in our schools. Our SROs are highly visible on school campuses as they patrol and as they teach crime prevention courses such as driver's ed in our high schools. SROs are also responsible for investigating violations of law that occur on school campus. Daily, I must say that again, daily, they engage in positive relationships with students and staff becoming a part of the school faculty family. They are considered family and we've talked about that. Again, the safety of students and faculty is our number one top priority, is one of the division's top priorities. Training is conducted at least twice a year with all school faculty to ensure that they know how to respond to emergencies that may occur on a school campus. Lord forbid there was ever an active shooter situation. Our Henrico County school administrators, school staff, and officers are trained to know how to respond to such incidents. The county manager and Chief Cardinal meet quarterly with the school superintendent, Dr. Cashwell, to share information that may affect faculty, students, and with the same end in mind, they always talk about safety. I can tell you something that happened with last year, year before, one time they were meeting, they actually ended up walking around Verina High School together, and what a show of togetherness and how we all work together. There are several police sergeants who supervise our school resource officers who assist with comprehensive safety audits at each individual school. This is a huge task that we do a partnership with and audits are completed on a three year rotation. We also have a group called School Intelligence Group and this is a group of Henrico, Chesterfield, Hanover and Richmond school resource officers who meet to discuss concerns and issues that we all share. And we meet with our school safety staff and that's done once a month through the entire school year. We also have our PAL program, and I know several of you all are very familiar, whether you have visited our Police Athletic League or you have children that are a part of that. We have officers that work in several schools and they have summer programs. There are so many other programs I can list. I'm just going to name a few. We are so excited to still be a part of the Achievable Dream Academy at Highland Springs High School, all of our Special Olympics meets. The Chief has a Students Advisory Board law enforcement clubs at certain schools. Here at Glen Allen High School, the school resource officer was the step dance coach. What a way to mentor young people to be able to do that. We also have threat assessments. We have student government day, too smart to start, and our youth star services, which is where we deal with mental health and we talk all the time about different young people who may need services. I will refer you to your timeline. There were several changes that were made, and one occurred in 2015. And if you look at your timeline, there is a brief description there. And it talks about us making changes that really were to put more of an emphasis on discretion instead of making arrest. And some people talk about the school to prison pipeline, and we looked at those numbers. And the data that we saw and the changes that we made, when we made changes to de decide to work more with our schools to divert people within the justice system, we saw the number of arrests or charges go down, and we saw the data showed us that the number of people that we were referring to our school faculty and administrators for diversion programs went up. And so we saw that, and that occurred in 2015. Also in 2015, we made some changes where not only did our school resource officers have to go to a state school, they had to go to a week-long school where we talked about a variety of topics. It could be everything from fair and impartial policing to dealing with children with different disabilities to whatever topics and new things come along with the General Assembly and our Commonwealth attorneys would be involved and they would come and teach us. So we've gone above and beyond and we've done that for many, many years starting from 1976, but again, making changes along the way. You will see on your timeline, there's um, MOUs that we have signed and you've seen different times where we've added extra officers to different schools because we've seen an increase of things that have happened at schools. I can tell you in last school year alone, we had 85% of the calls that we responded to at a school as a police school resource officer were because a school administrator, a school parent, someone in the school called us there. So although we are walking around and we're doing things self-initiated, we are there for the school and the school wants us there. They're calling us to help them because there may be an issue that they can't resolve. Again, we are there to help with the crime, and schools are the ones that will deal with anything that is a violation of a school policy. 
So many things we can talk about also in 2017, you'll see in your timeline, there was at one point that we took SROs out of the middle school. And I will tell you, we heard from numerous parents and numerous administrators and the following year, we put them back in there because they missed them and they wanted them there. And that was a response, a joint partnership that we had. I can tell you so many things about statistics and the training that we do all the time. But for me, the biggest piece is relationships. There are many, many people who school resource officers who have relationships with students, with faculty, with administrators, with teachers, with principals. Many people call the SRO their friend, their mentor, the one that they look to. And I ask you to keep this unique partnership here in Henrico County Schools. We want people to feel safe. But what better way for us to help with the healing process that's going on across the United States and across the world than for our school resource officers to be a part of that healing process and to stay and learn and teach and recruit young people. So I ask you to please keep that in mind. Again, number one, safety, but number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, relationships, relationships, relationships. I'd be glad to take any questions that you might have about the school resource officer program. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Tony. Uh, are there any questions immediately among board members from either school or general government side? I do. Yeah, sure. Ms. Ogburn, go ahead. Is my mic what? Is it on? Yep. Yeah, there it is. Um, I just wanted to point out you brought to like the 2017 decision to bring middle schools, you know, have our SRS out of middle school. And I was one of the ones pushing to bring them back because I heard so loudly from parents that they wanted them back. So we did that the next year, which um, it, I don't know if anybody realizes that coincided with the um, shooting in Florida. And that prompted a lot of concern on part of parents and there was an outcry. So if you could address that just a little bit more about what you heard from parents, why they valued the SROs, and what led to the, position, the decision to put them back in all of our middle schools. So there were several factors that led to that. Again, there's training that we do throughout the year. And even though the SRO could show up or a community officer could show up and do that training, when they do that training with the faculty, there's a trust factor that they learn and they know and they feel confident about it. But what we heard from people is they didn't want just an officer coming off the road to come and talk to their, they wanted a person who was specially trained, someone who has a desire to work with young people. They wanted an SRO who wanted to be there and not that any other officer wouldn't, but it takes a special person to be a school resource officer. So we heard from school administrators and parents. And just one follow up. Um, are you familiar with the mascot at Cuyacuson by any chance? I am not. Um, Ms. Shea probably could address this more than me, but the mascot at Cleocasin is they're called the Griffins. And yes, that is, I, I am. point out after an SRO who was much beloved. Thank when you. The school name changed. I should have known that. Right. Yes, ma'am. Neil Griffin was a school yeah, resource absolutely. officer who was truly a member of his team and the faculty. And in fact, when he went through his illness, I was with him when we were there to tell the faculty, and they treated him with the utmost respect. He was, he was part of their family. Thank you for bringing Tribute that up. Tribute to the relationship piece that you're discussing. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Ms. Hogburn. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Atkins. Thank you so much for all the work that you do and, and providing the presentation that, that you're doing today. I do have a question around the use of pepper spray. And can you talk a little bit more about using OC spray, you know, on our children and also talk a little bit about the training for that? Sure. So when we, we have different tools that we use and we teach things called response to resistance. And so there's different things and different levels. So there has to be a certain threat level as to whether or not we would use something as to whether you could get somebody under control. And there's often questions about why would you need to do that uh, with a young person? But we all know too that there's sometimes there's young people who are in schools that may be taller or bigger than me and I may not be able to um, control them the way that they need to. And we wanna make sure that everybody is safe in the environment. So yes, they are trained, but police officer is trained that way. And the decision to use your OC spray would be something that would depend specifically on that situation. And again, you would be trained as to whether or not you could use some other tools to do that. Thank you for your response. My other question is around, um, you mentioned the, the mental awareness and some of the influence you have on our students in building that relationship uh, can you talk a little bit more about um, the types of conversations that you may have with our students? And I hear a lot of the trauma 
that happens from the students that are watching perhaps a de-escalation situation, whether it was a use of pepper spray or other means to defuse uh, a situation. And so I'm very interested in what opportunities or what activities take place between the SRO and some of the programs that you've mentioned to talk about why those particular activities or use of pepper spray and such um, are happening because I do believe that if you could potentially traumatize a child that is witnessing a friend being pepper sprayed. You, you could, you're absolutely right. We Each one of our police officers is trained in crisis intervention training and you've heard about that, but there's an even um, deeper training that goes with the crisis intervention that we do with our school resource officers. And we often have our school counselors, we have our school administrators that will turn to the SRO and ask them to speak to somebody you know, whether they're fearful of something, whether it's in an elementary school or in a middle or a high school. And we are always willing, whether it's in a, a club at a school or whether it is one-on-one -on -one with a counselor. Um, sometimes it's having lunch with students. Um, I know that happened um, here at Glen Allen. I can tell you that she would mentor them and she had people that wanted her to come to their graduation. Um, and could there be situations where we need to de-escalate things and that we need to talk to other people? Absolutely, but we still need that opportunity to do that, whether that's here in the school environment or out in the home environment. And by leaving our school having our school resource officers here, the opportunity for a positive interaction, you know, maybe in, in somewhere else they've seen someone be arrested and not had the opportunity to, to speak one-on-one -on -one with an SRO. But again, they have more in-depth crisis intervention training than all of our officers, and particularly they work with our our STAR team, which is part of a team that we meet with to talk about other, other avenues that they might need for mental health um, challenges. Thank you for your response. Mr. Nelson? Yes, sir, thank you. Mr. Manager, I have a question for you. I'm looking at this timeline and I don't, um, I know there was a point where we, um, the Board of Supervisors and the County Manager looked at um, SROs. There was a concern about um, police and charges on students several years ago. I can't remember exactly when that was, but do you remember when that was when um, we, with the school board, just looked at the difference between what an SRO does as it relates to discipline and the uh, school security, safety officers. Officers. security officers, yeah. Yes, sir, that would have been uh, 2015. It was uh, with, uh, uh, with Doug Middleton. Uh, Dr. Kinlaw was the uh, superintendent and what led that, uh, what caused that discussion to occur was a series of, or a number of incidents that, as I recall, SROs were put in a position where they were asked to administer some sort of discipline, school discipline, um, to uh, uh, by administrators in the schools. And ultimately, after a number of conversations, um, there was a recognition that the school security officers had to have a greater role. Linda, you were there. And also that there was a change in how um, juveniles were quote unquote arrested. So that whole process was redone where basically there was a, uh, um, the uh, JVR. JVR, Juvenile Violation Report, so that instead of someone being put into custodial arrest, they could be placed on what's called a JVR, and they're referred to the juvenile criminal justice system, but perhaps they were going to get services that they need, whether it had to do with something um, larceny reduction, um, truancy issues, so that they weren't necessarily a part of the criminal justice system. So all of it changed. We were the first locality in the region, maybe in the state, to, to put this, make this change. And since that, the uh, now the quarterly meetings that I have with uh, Chief Cardinal and Dr. Cashwell, the numbers that I, I remember seeing back in 2014 and 15, totally different. So is there a way that we can um, get a report just to make some comparisons? And the reason that I'm asking this when I hear um, Chief, what's your um, what's, what's your title? I don't want to miss. Linda is my name, but Assistant Chief Linda Tony. Well, Assistant Chief, <laughs> Assistant Chief Tony um, is speaking. So my my biggest concern has always been 
um, school to prison pipeline. It's hard to not, as a black man, it's hard to not focus on um, that back in 14, 15, 13, 14, whenever. What was happening was in the schools that had a predominant um, or had a majority of minority students, in particular black students, we were seeing um, charges filed in a, at a way higher level than in other, other schools. And so if a kid got into a fight, not only were they being suspended for fighting, but they were also getting simple assault charges. And um, that was a challenge, that, that, was, um, that was an issue. And so I think that also was a push. I would love to see where the numbers are now compared to where they were and what schools still in particular are um, students getting charged I don't want to know the names, but can we see what the, what the charges are and what the numbers are? It's my struggle and tension with officers and schools. I've talked to teachers and administrators and students, and they're a fair share in the high schools that I represent that um, they look for, they look to the officers for safety and for protection at the school. Um, I know at Highland Springs in particular, I haven't heard much about Verona, um, but there seems to be a pretty decent relationship between the two SROs there. And so if students and administrators feel safer because of SROs and schools, um, they're the ones in the school. So I, I want to listen to that and I want to hear that. My job is, my responsibility is to make sure though that our students are not being criminalized. And that's what I want to continue to focus on. I, I don't want to get into this too much today, but I do I do see 2019 an additional SRO was added to Tucker High, placing two officers on campus. Currently six high schools have two assigned SROs. That's in Rico, Hermitage, Highland Springs, Tucker, Verona, and Virginia Randolph. And again, just off the top of my head, that looks like six schools with a majority of black and, black and brown people there. So I would love to hear why those are there um, at those two schools. Now you can speak on that if you want to, but yes, if sir. not, I would love to. I would love to hear about um, those things. So that's. I just want to share that's on my attention. Is that we have SROs in schools and they're focusing on relationship building and safety and providing a positive environment for our kids, great. I don't want them in schools if it's gonna be increasing charges on, particularly on black and brown kids, and then that puts them in the prison to school pipeline. So Reverend Nelson, I, know, I think there were several questions there. One I can address, when we add an additional school resource officer to a school that already has one, it's because we've seen an increase in calls for service or the violence of the, calls for service that were there. And then I go back to the not necessarily self-initiated, but again, that school administration. And this is a partnership that we're gonna sit down with Courtney Berry and Dr. Cashwell. And we're gonna talk about, is this truly needed? And we're gonna have facts that we talk about as to whether or not that second one should be added. So each time that one has been added, it's been because of an increase in calls that we've seen there. And Reverend Nelson, I believe your second or your first point was about wanting to share and see some of the statistics. And I, I know I need to point that to the county manager. I know those are things that you all talk about with Dr. Cashwell and Chief Cardinal. Okay. So we absolutely can provide both boards um, the uh, statistics between 2015, 2017, and now, so that you all have a snapshot. But generally, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, the uh, trend has been obviously downward. Yes, and sir. And with the uh, implementation of the JVR, we are seeing, I mean, it, it, I think last year, the number of actual arrests was, I could count on one hand if my memory is uh, serving me right. Let me get those out for you. Are you talking about custodial arrests where someone was actually, yes. it, was, it was eight custodial arrests okay. this year. Um, but again, remember, we weren't in, only in school till March, and there was 15 custodial arrests last school year. And you go back, and I'll share. I, so we, eight, eight arrests for the whole school yes, district? Yes, okay. 52,000 kids, 72 right. facilities. But if, so, you can, if you can give me that number breakdown by schools? Absolutely. Yes, and, sir. Um, and you said increased calls. So, so I, don't, I don't know, is that something that is documented? 
where we can see how many calls come from each school. Yes, sir. So okay. we actually take the statistics. Our school resource officers note every time that they are called to an incident by a school administrator, a faculty member, or a parent. Uh, we keep those statistics so that we have them. And again, that's where we understand where, A, we are initiating some things, but a lot more than what we're initiating, we're being called to ask to help. And it may be because there's an assault that an administrator can't handle. And sometimes it's an assault on a faculty member that we have to help with. So yes, sir, we do have Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, just in the interest of time and to keep things moving, we've got about five or six minutes left in this section. And certainly we can go over, but I just want to make note of that for the timeline. I, um, as the manager mentioned, uh, we have a we have a hard stop. Um, just I'll, before I turn it back over to the chairman to continue questioning, and it looks like Mr. Cooper has a question. I have a comment more, of a, more than a question um, as we go forward. I, I was reading this timeline and some of the things that, that brought joy to what I was reading were some of the things Mr. Nelson just mentioned as well. There's several pieces in here that talk about education opportunities in school, right? We're in a building that education is the, is the primary focus anyway. So to have, to have the ability to educate, you, the, this program and our, and our police force has shown the, the ability to do this through the Signal Blue program in 2009, which of course taught about active shooters. And I think we were educating teachers and students and faculty and administrators alike on that. I would, I would deem that a win in, in two organizations coming together and sharing resources. Um, the PEAK program that we saw for a couple of years in the elementary school program where police educators and kids got together, I'm, I'm guessing that was an educational based program. We saw it with the DARE program, of course, with resistance to drugs in school. Um, I, I would just offer to this group, and again, Ma'am, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tony, not, not a question, but a comment to this group is if those conversations among our groups can continue on how we can utilize the resources that law enforcement officers have in schools, and if there's an appropriate way that you all feel it can be applied to both faculty, administrators, and students, I, I would love to see that those things continue. You, you mentioned CIT training. Our law enforcement officers are trained deeply in recognition of, of those types of instances. Um, you know, can, can our teachers benefit from sessions and things like that? Can we share resources back and forth? Teachers are trained on how to teach. Can they share resources back to our officers on, on how to mentor and, and, and relationship building and things like that that teachers are so good at? So education as a process, as a part of this, I think has a huge piece. And Mr. Nelson touched on it. You know, he said, I can see SROs in schools when it's for a purpose and for the right purpose. I will stand here and say, I support SROs being in our schools. And if we can utilize those education pieces to a better benefit, I think those opportunities e exist. And before I turn the mic back over, I will say, you mentioned the DARE program, but you're not getting out of here without the, an easy one. There's a female officer in this program right now that, that you talked to in the DARE program when she was six. Yes, sir. Um, so thank you for that. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman? Any other questions? I have a question. Go, go ahead, yeah. Reverend Taylor. So thank you, Assistant Chief Tony, for kind of clarifying what the, the stated goals are, uh, safety relationship building, uh, reinforcing positive behaviors. I want to thank you and Officer Banks for the great job you all do. The question I have is around on our agenda, we have upcoming school year. So we would be tone deaf to the, the conversations that are going on around our globe, our nation, our city in regards to racism and social injustice and how it's exploded with, you know, the context of policing um, in relationship to society. So the question I raise is, I know that we, we participate with the school intelligence group. As we look forward to 20, the next school year, what, how are we going to determine what reforms we might need to make, you know, and what changes might occur that might help us to be better at what we're doing and being sensitive to the climate that we find ourselves in right now? Absolutely. And it starts, you and I have talked about this, where we cannot make change unless we're communicating. And so we need to hear what it is that we need to do different. And we need to hear what's working as well. So when we get together, we are ready in August to have our week-long training, and we're ready to add anything to that training that we need to, that we as a group think would benefit our school resource officers. Uh, we are ready to start the school year with our resource officers in hand to be there. And we want to be part of that relationship, part of the healing. And again, I think we can do that, whether it's sitting and reading Dr. Seuss books to our elementary kids, 
and helping do some more recruiting in the high school. We just more conversations, but we are really ready and open to have those conversations to make those changes. Good. Yes, um, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. As I, as as we move forward, and we're hearing, uh, like Reverend Cooper said, from about social injustice, and and I'm reading emails from students and parents about the pain and the trauma um, that some of these relationships in our schools actually bring. Um, and before you actually have your training session in August, what comes to mind maybe as something we need to work on? I think we really need to talk about what people are learning at home and how we can change perceptions because there's so much reality that it's got to be a joint effort together that what is it that is traumatizing you? What have you seen? What have you heard about police? And realizing that not each and every one of us is not just like there's not a bad teacher, there's not every bad police officer. Um, Captain Banks said at one time, nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. How can we change those perceptions if we don't have those conversations? And we can't have those conversations if we're not in the school to be able to talk to the kids. So we've got to talk about that and realize it's got to be open, calm conversations. And however we can do that, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a classroom or the kids who have the most um, non-trusting with someone that's sitting down and breaking bread together, we've got to figure out how we can do that. Thank you. Questions? Any other questions? None? Lieutenant Colonel, thank you. Uh, we're going to transition over to COVID. Mr. Manager, is that correct? Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Dr. Cashwell is going to lead us through this discussion. She also has uh, county staff that may augment any conversation regarding queening and, and PPE and where we are there. but. Dr. Cashwell. Dr. Cashwell, Thank you. before you start, I'd like to apologize to, to the group for running late today. Uh, as I was trying to change into a suit, an emergency happened, so I, I got a little bit delayed. I apologize to everyone. Dr. Cashwell, you have the floor. Thank you. Good to have you with us. And um, at your agenda may indicate that Dr. Beth Teigen would be uh, joining us for this presentation and leading uh, the conversation around uh, our COVID response and particularly reopening, but she also had a family emergency and wasn't able to join us, but do want to thank her in her absence as well as a number of the uh, Henrico County team uh, who are here today who have been um, incredibly involved in not only responding to what, uh, as many of you know, was a very abrupt uh, and unfortunate closure in March to our school year, but also making plans on how we'll uh, continue to move forward and reopen. Um, so, uh, we've also enjoyed uh, an outstanding partnership uh, in coordinating our emergency management response uh, with county government staff, and, and, and partic particularly Jackson Maynard has been a, an outstanding help along with a number of members of the team as we've been uh, not only responding to our current situation, but thinking about what those, ne those critical next steps are. So, again, with March, um, Marking that a period of emergency closure as mandated by the government um, certainly brought a disappointing end to the school year, but a swift action from the Henrico County Schools team to make sure that our students who count on daily nutrition continued to receive that, that we were able to bridge uh, some of the gaps with uh, devices and, and uh, making sure students had all the tools they needed to be engaged uh, in the best manner possible with, again, what was an abrupt and unfortunate close to the school year. And then making up time of uh, celebrating our students as they would have been uh, with us in person, closing out the school year. So we just um, are finishing up the third in a wave of fantastic graduation celebrations to make sure that we are honoring our graduates, honoring our students uh, in any manner possible. So uh, certainly uh, no one misses our students more than we do. Our staff and, and board have often commented on that very empty feeling we've had. And uh, there's nothing we want more than to have our students back at school buildings um, so that we can continue to build those relationships and work with them. So on June 9th, Governor Northam announced a phase reopening for our pre-K through 12 schools. And that guidance that um, he provided also applies to private uh, schools and child care centers in the state. And the idea of these reopening plans uh, was that schools would gradually re resume instru uh, instruction while, of course, prioritizing health and safety of students and staff. So 
course, our team has been um, using that guidance to develop plans that balance that need to make sure we're maintaining a safe environment, not only for our students, but for our employees. And so, um, you know, a number of the guidelines uh, are challenging uh, to implement. The most challenging probably being uh, the social distancing that's required through any number of phases. So um, the guidance that was released applies to phase three. And so the plans we're making for opening in the fall are under the assumption that Virginia will be in phase three in September. And I only bring that up because we're currently not in phase three. And while we all anticipate that announcement coming, I think it's important to note that much of uh, the planning that we're doing counts on the fact that we would have to be in phase three um, at that period in which our school year would begin. So uh, based on that phase three guidance, we see uh, recommendations in place for continued social distancing, daily health screenings, um, increased cleaning protocols, keeping groups of students together, um, and making sure that we're cleaning spaces um, between use between one group of students and another. And so um, taking into account those safety guidelines and sort of imagining how we might be able to best serve students in person. Among the most challenging is of course the distancing, right? So being able to bring kids in on buses while distanced and still serve them in our uh, facilities in a manner that creates that distance that's recommended has caused us to look at a number of options. And again, why we have not landed on any one plan, we are researching options that will allow us uh, to bring the most students back possible at one time and serve them in a face-to-face -face manner uh, as we recognize, uh, nothing can replace the face-to-face -face instruction that is happening in our classrooms, and, and we want to create the, the most opportunity for that to happen. So we've been looking at some hybrid models where we might, um, you've seen things about A-B days, where one group is, you know, a classroom might be split in half so that the students would be able to distance while inside the class. Um, they would come in on one day, participate in some remote learning the next day, and then the next group would come in like an A-B schedule. We've examined half-day schedules um, and any number of options, and we continue um, to work through uh, potential options that will, of course, maintain safety. Um, we are very interested in hearing from our community and from our employees. We have a survey ready to launch uh, tomorrow that we are um, hoping strong responses from our families in regards to what their needs are, what their, um, what their considerations are, what their concerns are, what their relative comfort level is uh, regarding sending their students back to school in relation to the safety guidelines uh, we do plan to adhere to. And so um, hearing from our employees and also our families will allow us to shape up those plans uh, with them in mind as well. And so we um, know early on, we've heard from a number of families who have indicated that regardless of the plans, uh, until a vaccine is, um, is, is in place, uh, they're not comfortable sending their students back to school. So we are, op we are putting a um, fully virtual option in place. So again, regardless of what the in-person uh, return may look like, offering a fully virtual option for families uh, for whom that will best needs and their concerns. Um, and so that may change once we hear from our families regarding their plans. Uh, some of our uh, potential plans because we won't know how many students we intend to serve in person because the distancing is that critical um, piece of the puzzle when it comes to figuring out how many students uh, can safely be in our spaces at one time. So Again, that survey is really going to drive that. Um, some of the associated plans and costs that come with a full re um, no matter what it might look like, will be increased clean cleaning protocols, certainly. And um, we've worked uh, very well with, with uh, our county government team to work on making some initial purchases, whether it's for PPE, cleaning supplies and materials for really the increased cleaning that will need to happen both on our buses and inside our school buildings, in, uh, depending on how our plans roll out at multiple times during the day. You know, so, uh, Dr. Um, Cashwell, yes. let me, um, let me, and I apologize, Mr. Chairman, but I think yes. this is a good example. Dr. Cashwell was describing a art class the other day. And if you want to think about just the cleaning that the, the schools are going to have to undertake, talk to the boards about that example you gave me. I'm trying to recall the example, but I, I certainly know that if students are to 
uh, one group of students would visit a space, maybe an art classroom, before the next group of students would come in, we would have to um, clean and sanitize that space in between groups of students. Um, same thing as we would rotate bus loads of students. Um, and so wanting to be responsible and keeping those cleaning protocols up. And of course, we'll be working on increasing opportunities for students to um, hand wash during the day and those sorts of things, really educating our families, our staff members and our students um, also about monitoring their own health and safety. So while health daily health checks um, are part of the recommendations, you know, how we implement that, um, whether it's through temperature screenings or questionnaires or parents sort of certifying before their kids come to school that they've taken that upon themselves to make sure that their kids are well and, and are not symptomatic. So uh, we understand there'll be a lot of uh, working with our community, our parents and our employees to make sure that uh, we're monitoring the safety of the situation throughout. But certainly um, increased uh, cleaning protocols is certainly something that comes to mind right away when we think about um, some of that increased cost. Um, but we're still, again, until we land on a plan that we think will best meet the needs of our employees, our students, allow us to implement uh, a safe plan for reopening, uh, you know, we're still working through the, the parameters of that cost, but certainly um, that's uh, something we, we want to keep our eye on as we move forward with our planning. So that I think covers a, a broad overview. I really want to leave the bulk of the time for questions you all may have and happy to answer those um, as they come up. And I, I would also note that we've worked really closely with uh, the EOC related to how they've been opening government spaces and looking at their reopening plans and some of their mitigation strategies and coordinating efforts and also making sure that we're learning from one another in regards to those safe practices for public spaces. Any questions for Dr. Cashwell? Dr. Cashwell, yes. If you could expand on uh, sort of a misconception, I think it would help the public. Um, we've been getting a lot of emails where people assume that it is completely up to the school board to decide whether we go back, how we go back, and what that will look like. And the distinction between mandates, that kind of thing, and what actual school board authority is in this case. Because I think there is a public confusion about that. And Ms. Egbert, I'll, I'll jump on, on the back of that. Uh, we as a board, as, as you all as a board know, we don't have any legal authority over what you guys do at all. And we, each one of us, received how many emails are we averaging now? 250, 300 a day? And yes, which is, yes, cash well, very frustrating for us because yeah. the answer that we have to say is, uh, first of all, we don't know. And second, we, we, we don't have any. So, if you could expand on, and so we really get a good public understanding, mm -hmm. as, as Ms. Ogburn asked, would be fantastic. <laughs> but but also, um, uh, yeah, leave it at that. Certainly, and, and I would imagine the frustration you feel as an elected body receiving those emails mirrors a lot of the frustration we feel as a school staff as we try to uh, manage any number of factors um, that have come from both the Virginia Department of Education, our local health department, and of course their guidelines are mir mirrored off um, CDC guidelines and do take into account uh, things like the impact on local communities, what the community spread has been. Um, and so we, we understand why those guidelines are in place and want to make sure that as we're creating our reopening plans, uh, we are adhering to those, at least those basic guidelines. And now certain there is certainly uh, the VDOE has indicated some flexibility in how those guidelines are put into practice in the schools. And so we want to make sure that uh, we're working with, uh, with the school board and with our uh, legal team to make sure that as we're making those plans, um, we're, we're implementing them in a manner that, again, best meets uh, health of employees and of students, uh, given those guidelines. Okay, and, and recap, please, those guidelines come from who? Uh, the Virginia Department of Education issued the guidelines, which are based on both uh, CDC guidance and local, uh, local health department and Virginia health department guidance. And so um, they, of course, uh, put those uh, phased guidelines for schools in place to mirror the same phases that the um, state is going through at various periods. So, for example, 
Uh, we're currently in phase two, uh, there's phase two uh, guidance for schools, just as there are for community spaces and businesses. Uh, the guidance that we're looking at for reopening schools in the fall is based off of phase three guidance. Again, as it's uh, the VDOE phase three guidance um, mirrors to coincide with when the state would be in phase three, if that makes sense. Okay, one more question in regards to that, Dr. Cashwell. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have that published anywhere? There is a document on the VDOE website, uh, website, and I believe it's it's three R's reopen, and uh, but yes, it's very public facing, and uh, we've actually included it in our um, community documentation that we've sent out as well as it may be linked to our site, but um, we we can certainly ensure that you all are provided a copy because that's that's Mr. Manager, it's one yes, Mr. Oh, you, you can finish your thought. I do. That's that's one thing that I don't think we thought of for for to help our citizens that ask us, look, these are the guidelines and this is where they're, if, if we could, they are on, I'm sure you're going to inform me, are they on your your website? Do you know? I mean, they are. That I had a different comment, okay. but yeah. If, if, if we could, Dr. Cashwell, sure. get where they're located, a link, okay. and if they're not you know, in, de in very detailed, I'd recommend that you put them in very detailed because I think that would help us as a community and as two parts greatly. Absolutely, and it, it is a several hundred page document. I'll tell you that we continue to work through our understanding of that document uh, and again, interpreting that uh, with the guidance of our legal team and uh, asking clarifying questions of the Virginia Department of Education and of the Virginia Health Department on a regular basis as we seek to make sure we fully understand the guidelines as they're written and what our responsibility is as a school division related to implementing those guidelines, but also managing um, a swift return for our students. Thank you, Michelle. Dr. Cashwell, I know our risk management department is an important part of this conversation. Would it be possible at our July work session to have a presentation from the risk management department specifically related to COVID uh, and open procedures? Yeah, I'll certainly make your request known to legal counsel and I know that they can provide um, some guidance there. Thank you. And Dr. Cashwell, if you, if you would like our assistance as well from REOC, uh, please request that. Most certainly. We, we've continued a, a great uh, dialogue. We're not working Jackson hard enough. He's, he's, he's only working <laughs> he 27 hours a, every, a day. I think any, he can squeeze a couple more. Any employees. meeting I've ever been to, he's <laughs> been there. So uh, I, I think so. He's working double and triple time. And we, we surely appreciate the expertise that he continues to uh, lend us as we consider, um, you know, just anything from examining our spaces, uh, our buildings, our office workspaces, et cetera, uh, and using some protocols to determine how to most uh, safely reopen those. And yep. Dr. Cashel, I just want to follow up to clarify, and maybe this is a question more for Megan, to go back to my original part of my question mm -hmm. about school board authority, yeah. because we are getting questions every day about what is it we actually have the authority to do? So Megan, if you could uh, expand on that possibly, or just so that we're clear, I know the answer, but I just think we need to make sure that everybody knows the answer as to what we can actually do based on, I know the word guidelines is confusing to people, but we need to just clarify that. But, okay. Better now? Okay. So I think that this is a very complicated legal question, um, and maybe not complicated, but I do think it is a matter that I would love to advise the board on in um, another another form, possibly. I think it would be a great session item or agenda item for that matter. Um, I do think that adhering to the guidelines is the most legally sound position, and I have spoken to Dr. Cashwell about this matter um, for a number of reasons. The guidelines uh, do provide a lot of information for the board to consider. Any yes, I had a question for Dr. Cashwell. Mm -hmm. um, given some of the correspondence and, and emails that we're receiving, and they all seem to ask this question, as do some of the signs around the room. In phase three, do you anticipate a five day return? Uh, we anticipate our students learning five days a week and as many days as we can have them in our school buildings. 
that is Excuse me, ladies important. and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a work session. We're not taking comments from, from you all, please. Yeah, I don't well, want to have you know, so, but to your point, uh, you know, understanding how many students will be expecting back in the fall so we know how many students will be in our buildings and how we can, uh, the more students we can bring in to our spaces by using some creatively and still implementing the distancing um, that is part of those recommendations will help us know how many days that'll be possible. And certainly our aim is for as much of a full return as possible. And then um, I have two, two more questions. Um, hearing a lot from teachers, parents that need to plan, when do we anticipate releasing our back to school timeline, perhaps? Well, uh, as I stated earlier, our survey will go out. Uh, it's planned to go out uh, this week, uh, hopefully tomorrow, and leaving about a week and a half for response. That'll give us some, hopefully, from some big picture feedback. Uh, we'll continue to, again, as I've mentioned, we're seeking uh, further clarification from the VDOE, from the Virginia Health Department related to a number of their guidelines and any um, potential flexibility there may be within those. Uh, we'll have an idea again of what we believe the intent of our families is regarding to whether they'll be opting for the fully virtual option or they're looking to return in person. Um, we'll also know, know more from our staff about their comfort level uh, you know, in returning and that will help us shape our plans. Um, you know, we also have to put in writing a plan for both our learning uh, and our health mitigation uh, to the VDOE prior to reopening. So we would want to have those plans ready uh, by midsummer so that we could submit those to VDOE uh, for their consideration and any feedback they may have as we may need to fine tune plans for reopening. Uh, and, and of course, communicate that as soon as we can to our families, um, but also not wanting to commu communicate too soon, realizing that there's still some unknown information, um, not only areas where we're seeking clarification, but we're working off some assumptions based on phase three, and we've not entered phase three yet. So I think we'd want some comfort level that uh, we are indeed going to be in phase three before we would release any plans. And then the last question, as to our phase three, um, we're getting a lot of questions and a lot of parents seem to share some of the same concerns. Is there a way we could create another FAQ just with commonly asked questions for phase three return to school? What does it look like for our parents and teachers and staff? There's no reason we can't work to put an FAQ together uh, related to this topic. And I would imagine certainly as uh, plans become more concrete, not only would be, we be actively communicating them through email and those sorts of channel, channels, you may expect to see some videos about what students might be expecting uh, with a return to normal, uh, return to school that might not look like they're used to, if they're going to be expecting to see their teacher in a mask, how they might prepare for that, especially our younger students, um, and any other number of things we want to help uh, our students and their uh, families in regards to reopening. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, question, um, Dr. Cashwell, question and comment. So am I hearing you say that we have yet to determine what the return looks like? Absolutely. Uh, we have not made a firm plan. Uh, at, on June 9th, that guidance was released for a, uh, re in regards to a phase three re reopening. So that allowed us to begin planning what that may look like based on those guidelines. Um, but certainly wouldn't want to make plans without hearing from our community, hearing from our parents, hearing from our employees, and again, seeking uh, clarification regarding the VDOE documents and guidelines and any flexibility we may have in managing those uh, given uh, the, the needs of our school division. So, so did you, I thought I read something about um, a, a possible physical return and a virtual track as well yeah we we have heard so much from uh families of students who have indicated no matter what a reopening would look like whether it's five days a week two days a week uh half day part day full day they're not comfortable sending their kids uh their students rather or their children back to public schools um in absence of pain in the uh in the community so we um, are creating a fully, what we're calling a parallel option or a virtual option, which will allow those families uh, to enroll their students in that manner as well. So a virtual option will be, I'm just making sure that I'm hearing. A, yes, that much. 
tell us of what the return plan looks like. That's correct. There will be a virtual option that is offered to That students. can be leveraged. It, it may be okay. a student, uh, him or herself, has a immunocompromised uh, situation, or there may be a family situation that necessitates it, or simply the comfort level of the family. We want to be responsive to that um, and make sure that um, we're managing that the best way possible, but still providing that access. So that that is what has been referred to as a parallel option at times. Um, but that is a fully virtual option, yes. Right. So my comment, I just want to go on the record and say, especially to my school board colleagues, Dr. Cashwell, um, just take the time that you need to make sure that you make the best decision. I mean, we've never been here before. There are, um, this is tough on everyone. It's tough on the schools, making adjustments for the learning environment. It's tough on the parents. Um, they want to know what's going to happen, um, yet still hopefully caring about the health and safety of their own children. Um, and so I, I'm certain that you guys are gonna do everything you can to make sure that um, you make the best decisions. I will hope that there are, that there are tracks um, for parents who are not comfortable. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing from parents who are saying that they just don't feel comfortable sending their kids back to school every day. And I also know that there are parents who have to return to work hearing from teachers who are saying, how am I going to teach and my kids at home? So you guys have to take all of this into consideration. And I know there are going to be different crowds that are pulling on you, but this is an important decision that's going to shape, um, shape us for a while. And it really could have some, some impact. And so you guys just do what you can to try to make the best decision um, and to allow for uh, some space for everybody. So that's just my two cents. And, and, and please keep those special education students in mind uh, for whatever track you move on, that there's still going to need to be some additional supports that they need um, regardless. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Darren, any other questions? And I do have a, a question as well. Okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Castro, can you also talk a little bit more about some of the research that we're doing to better support our teachers. Um, I have had several conversations with teachers, custodians, nurses. We want to make sure for our nurses that we have the proper PPE in place for when our children return. One of those things looks like having the latest and greatest uh, thermometers so that you can place it in front of the child's forehead and take the temperature. So across our country, there is a shortage in PPE. We would be remiss to bring all our kids back and not have all the adequate equipment that we need. So those are conversations that are, helping, uh, that are happening across the United States. They are, those are conversations that Dr. Cashwell is having. Those are conversations that I'm having with our nurses that are in our schools. Also, with the conversations that I am having with teachers that are critically concerned, that have underlying conditions that are more susceptible to COVID-19. So as we continue to, to try to do our best as a school board to make the best decisions, there are so many parts and pieces in order to try to get this right. And the biggest piece is making sure that we're all educated, that we all have the appropriate supplies that we need to make sure that we keep our kids and our teachers, our custodians who will be doing overtime to clean these buildings. And let's talk about budget. We know that our budget has been slashed. And so all of these conversations are happening. We do want our kids back in schools but we don't want to lay our heads down at night knowing that one child died because we didn't take the appropriate time to make sure we did everything that we could. So with that said, Dr. Cashwell, can you talk a little bit more about how critical the data uh, coming into us from family surveys is needed? There's also data coming into us from the CDC. There's data coming into us from the VDOE. And then there's other local organizations that provide data to us at a very street level that we need to understand. We have to dissect it. And then we have to engage in a, 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 just a variety of conversations 
And that includes the survey that families and teachers will be receiving. That's going to include information that we just have to wait to receive until the governor provides it. And so, Dr. Castro, I really would like for you to talk a little bit more about how critical data is needed, and we don't have some of that yet to even provide answers. Well, so thank uh, you. Certainly regarding, I think PPE was one of the things that you mentioned. And, and so um, while we're certainly working with EOC to make those kinds of purchases, make sure we have cleaning materials, um, you know, I, I would imagine there is um, still some relative uncertainty related to whether we'd have those things in place uh, to, and making sure that we would have them before we would release any plans for reopening our schools so that um, any promise to the community that we're making regarding safety measures is something we feel confident we can implement and we would have the materials on hand to do so. And so um, that is uh, certainly a critical factor. And then, you know, we continue to stay tuned to uh, our local health department. And so while we know VDOE issue, issued some broad guidance at the state level, um, community health mitigation is certainly um, always of concern and, and we'll be staying tuned um, to the local and regional area um, so that again, we can assume we're tracking with the phases as the, as the rest of the state is. And if there were to be any changes to that or uh, you know, the local area were to go back a phase or perhaps progress more quickly that we would be able to respond to that accordingly with our plan. So all of those are critical data points for us. Any other questions for Dr. Cashwell in regards to that? Mr. Chairman, just really briefly, I know we're right up on our time to move on. Uh, just a quick statement. Um, we discussed the plan that came out June 9th a little bit. That recover, redesign, and restart plan is 136 pages, yes. right? So, it, and it's remarkably detailed. Yes. Um, I, I would encourage us, as Mr. Brandon, as our chairman mentioned earlier, let's share that everywhere we can. I know we probably are, but let's promote it even more. It's clear, it's bullet pointed, it's, and it's remarkably, it's remarkably crystal clear that under phase three, which we will get into in July one, right? We're here in Wednesday, July one, that we should be able to move into, into phase three. It spells out specifically what you can and can't do and, and how the daunting task that's in front of you all to plan and, and hope that maybe we're out of phase three by September one is certainly a challenge. So one, I thank you for that. What we can do to help with that, I would, I would ask each of us to think both inward and outward, right? Let's think about what our, I know you are, uh, I've had conversations with my kind of part about it. What do our teachers and students and faculty need to, to exist? This clearly says that the stipulations will require distancing and it spells out what you need to do on a bus to do that. And it's really detailed. It goes into nutrition and recess and, and how, how do our inward thinking, what do we need to do it? But also outward thinking. We have families here who are clearly telling us that they have challenges as well. And I know you're doing that as well because Ms. Kinsella and I spoke about it as late as yesterday. So both those thought processes need to be there for us. And, and, and it's easy to say, well, the state is, you know, let us open it. We need to do the best we possibly can with what we have. And the challenge that exists for you is not, uh, I, don't, I, I don't envy you in this because you have to plan for a phase three opening at socially distanced percentage where they can't sit, they can't touch at six feet on buses, try it. And then also perhaps there's a, there's a piece here that says beyond phase three, it says it right here in their plan. And it says that if you're beyond phase three, there'll be a new normal and some restrictions may still apply. So I, I just want to say, as we're having conversations, as we have conversations, we're going to talk about what we can do inward to our teachers, our students, and our faculty, and our staff and our administration, but also what we can do for these families. Because I need folks back to work, and folks yeah. need to go back to work. They need their kids to go to school to do that. Yes. Um, so there's challenges on both sides. Mr. Nelson's right. This is a big decision. However, we can help you do that. Please engage. Uh, we are already talking about it. Please, please do so and continue that. And I would say that here's to hoping that we are beyond phase three by September 1. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Any, anyone else? Dr. Cashwell, before we move on to the next next topic, and I'm, we're trying to stay on schedule because we have a hard stop. Um, real quick, last time you were before the board uh, to do a quick review, we asked you uh, where we're at with, with redistricting, with all of that's going on in 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 the area in 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 henrico we don't know if kids are coming back have you put a hard stop on that and do you know when you'll come back and revisit it well certainly our board communicated uh to the public in april uh 
that they would be pausing the process given the health crisis and the inability to leverage the community as uh, was promised uh, in the process and would be a critical component for transparency. So I would defer to uh, our board, board chair, uh, our vice chair, if there are any comments you would wanna share related to that. Mr. Chair. So we haven't, we haven't had any more discussions yet. We will be revisiting the subject within the next few months and be able to speak definitively on next steps. So we have not had any discussions since that hard stop, but we will be revisiting soon to share with the public what our next steps are. Madam Vice Chair, anything you wanna add? So the only um, thing I would add is that we don't know what September's gonna look like. And so once we're back in school and we see what our numbers are, that um, I think we, again, we, like Reverend Cooper said, we have, we put the stop in April and until we know where we are, our plan is to revisit it as soon as we can. Okay, because I, and the, and the only reason I'm asking, uh, so this, this work session was, has been out there and I had a neighbor when I was walking my dog literally last night say, so what are they doing with the redistricting? And I said, you know what, I'll ask again. And they said, I said, but how, you know, we don't even know how many kids, if it, if it's gonna open, how it's gonna look, what it's gonna look like. So, but I'll ask the question. So I did. So for my neighbor, thank you, thank you for the information. Uh, Mr. Manager, you wanna move us next? Dr. Cashwell, thank you. Next, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of both boards, we move into the last presentation, which is a discussion on the capital improvement program. I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Megan Coates to come forward. This young lady has been with our county just a short period of time, but I will tell you she has been busy and she should be considered a resource for um, both boards. What you are going to see is a presentation on where we are with capital bonds, projects that are funded, and also the significant effort that was undertaken for two new high schools. I know Lenny Pritchard is here, who continues to give us updates. And uh, Megan is also going to cover the fact that as we continue to grow as a county, as we have more and more facilities, we really need to start looking at capital outside of a five-year horizon and start taking that longer-term 10-year horizon and she'll be quarterbacking an internal effort that does just that. Uh, Dr. Cashwell and I have spoken and both of our staffs are engaged in that effort. So without further ado, Ms. Coates. Mr. Mr. Manager, real quick, how long is this presentation? Because you know we got the hard stop. Are we gonna have some time to ask, ask questions? Five minutes or less. All right, thank you. Yep, I'll go ahead and jump right in. And I think your questions, Mr. Brandon, are really a great lead in. Um, to the capital improvement plan because some of those decisions that are made about uh, where students attend school are ultimately going to affect what facilities we need. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do a brief overview of the 2016 referendum projects focused primarily on school projects. Um, let me get my slides pushed ahead for me. It's on, but it's not. Uh, oh. There we go. Okay, so this is a summary slide of the 2016 referendum. The top seven projects, they are either complete or in punch list right now, so significant progress has been made. The projects listed in that red box, there are the ones that are currently under construction or two that have not yet begun construction, but all of them are in various phases of completion. Um, when the 2016 referendum was approved, the total budget for all of these projects was a combined $272 million. Ms. Coach. Yes. I don't mean to be rude, and I know we're, we're going to do this fast. So could you, because I even put my glasses on, <laughs> I yeah. can't see that, yeah. honestly, okay. and I don't have a sheet in front of me. So would you read it real quick? <laughs> yeah, so so what you're looking at, it's uh, each project from the 2016 referendum, the original budget, any new sources that either came to or from that project to complete the final budget, and then a note about whether it was a renovation or replacement, a new facility. Um, the important piece really is just that um, two high schools there originally were slated to be renovated. We all know they're now being fully replaced and that required a significant investment on part of the county. In fact, every possible source that could be identified was brought to bear to complete these projects, including meals tax proceeds, bond premiums, interest earnings, VPSA, uh, transfers from other projects and general fund. Um, and what I'm gonna try to give you today is just a 
quick review of the funding plans for the five projects that are outstanding and then give you a very brief intro to the CIP process, which is going to kick off very shortly. So for those remaining projects, uh, we had a bond sale last week. Because of the historically low interest rates, we were able to achieve um, a total interest cost of 1.49%. Because of that, we basically sold all of our remaining general obligation authority. Um, that gives us a little bit of flexibility in that we now have all $19 million for Adams Elementary in hand. That project was originally slated for fiscal 22, but these collective boards now have some flexibility to expedite that project if you so choose. Uh, one other change from funding plans that you have seen before is related to the two high school projects. Originally, those had a VPSA sale, which is the Virginia Public School Authority, um, also included some future meals tax collections. Because those projects are actively being constructed right now, we're going to flop the sources. So the general obligation bonds we sold last week will now be redirected to the high schools that fully funds all of those projects, inclusive of the FF&E. And ultimately what that translates to is that the last project on the list, the Glen Allen A Center, is the one where we now have to come up with a different funding plan. Um, total budgets remain intact, no change to those, but that just means that when we get to the next CIP process, which is where we'll reevaluate the Glen Allen A Center, that's where we would have to bring additional sources to bear like VPSA or some other cash. The revised CIP process will kick off in just a few weeks, and I'll highlight a couple of things that will feel or look differently for you. Um, project submissions will indeed be on a 10-year time frame. Um, that is important as you look at the inset chart there, and I'm sure that this is going to be even harder for you to see. Uh, but the point of this chart is just to look at the trajectory of our debt service budget. You see it really start to drop off there once we get to fiscal 24, 25, 26. Um, as people come to evaluate the county rating agencies specifically, when we start to decline on that type of trajectory, it signals that we're not investing heavily enough in our facilities. And because of that, we need to begin planning for the next referendum. We need to start planning now for an 8 to 10 to 12 year time frame. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing during this uh, CIP process that's about to go off. New this year, we'll have a cross-functional team. Uh, that will have representatives from building inspections, general services, schools, parks, utilities, planning, finance. Um, those people who are the subject matter experts will take every request that comes in from a department or from schools or from utilities and evaluate them to make sure that they are sound projects, that we've thought through any uh, potential issues. We've made sure that projects that maybe need to go timing wise together, we can plan them accordingly. And what we hope when you get to executive and legis legislative reviews, you'll have a plan that's reasonably able to be accommodated. There won't be any ambiguity about affordability. We're going to bring you a plan that's been prioritized based on your collective stated goals. Um, Last thing that I'll say here is that um, the fiscal 22 plan will also look a little bit differently in the outer years. Historically, Henrico has basically presented all of the projects that have been requested by various departments or agencies in those outer years. This year, we're going to bring a plan that's based on affordability. And so we're going to spend a lot of time over the next six months or so really evaluating what our facility needs are. Um, most immediately for fiscal 22, but absolutely over that 10 year horizon that was mentioned. Um, this last slide where I'll leave you for some conversation is just an excerpt from the board's uh, work session, the retreat in January. Um, this was a snapshot of the school division's needs at that point in time, not necessarily indicative of current priorities, but this is a great place to start as we kick off the 22 process. Um, what we hope to do is to take this list and similar lists from all of our other departments and uh, balance the needs for renovation and replacement of our older facilities against new facility needs for schools that seats for capacity for fire. That's the ability to run calls on a timely basis. We'll be reviewing all of those things. Um, and, and that's really what we hope to, to do this year is to transform the process a little bit to make it um, more intentional more um, predictable and to be able to meet all of the, the collective stated goals with our infrastructure needs. And so that, that's my quick overview and intro for discussion for you, sir. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Coates? Thank you. I do have a question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. 
Um, I had a hard time reading a piece of it, but just for clarification, I wanted to, if you could just go back to that last slide there under, I believe that says replacements. Um, is that Virginia Randolph? And I can't read the rest. Is it uh, the entire academies? Is it just the recreation piece? Is it partial? Can you talk to me a little bit about what, what that is? So I'll have to defer to, to Lenny on that one. Yes, ma'am. That was a replacement for the entire school project. Virginia Randolph. Now there's some historical value that school did that that's going to have to be considered as well mm -hmm. um, of not to tear down and destroy. So, mm -hmm. but but looking at it, not not going too far ahead. We we do think that there's enough land on that on that property to do a rebuild there without disruption, like we are with some of our other schools, like with Highland Springs, right. Tucker, and Holiday. So hopefully that would happen. But yes, that is a total reconstruction. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other for Lenny or Ms. Goods? Hearing none. It, excuse me. If we could get that presentation sent to us, please, so that we can see actually read it. Yep, I'd absolutely. appreciate it. Thank you. Are you going to Are you going to dismiss the meeting, or are you going to ask no. if we have any comments? No, we're going to have comments. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And sir. I want to do a thank you. And and I'm going to do my opening that I didn't do because I was late. So, Mr. Nelson, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, sure. Um, this is more so about the uh, the CIP. Uh, I'm sure all of us over the past few weeks, those of us who are on social media, have been seeing um, some equity conversations going around online. And I asked our our staff to pull some information that I thought would be um, that I thought would be good to just share with the general community. Um, you know, I disagree with some of what I've read. Uh, as it relates to um, what we've been doing and what we've not been doing. I think equity is a mindset that goes beyond just capital improvements. But if you want to talk about capital improvements, um, in particular over the last seven, eight years, uh, Henrico County, I think, has um, been doing a much better job as it relates to equity. And I'll, I'll share with you why I said that. But it all started in 13 when the board, of, the board of Supervisors established a dedicated revenue source to Henrico County Public Schools. Out of that um, came all of the meals tax dollars. And so um, capital projects, $9 million a year toward um, whatever the school saw fit as it relates to schools. And then if you start, and this is just about the equity conversation that I think is just easy to say that there's a certain level of inequity, um, and, and there is, and I'll tell you why, but as it relates to the dollars that we spend, uh, in Michael County Public Schools, it's usually 56 to 57 percent of the general fund budget every year. If you look at school infrastructures from the central to the eastern part of the county, uh, $25 million investment in Brooklyn Middle School, $38 million investment in Henrico High School, almost $20 million investment in Verona High School. That's all over the last few years. If you look at the bond referendum for 2016, originally the bond was for 273 million, now revised it's 366 million. Two high schools are now in the budget. Um, I mean, two high schools are now um, being built and that's Tucker and Highland Springs. Highland Springs wasn't even in the initial package and so that kind of disturbs me when I hear people um, talk about equity. The building of Highland Springs High School itself was an equity decision. So if we went off of what we had done in the prior up to 2018, we only built schools for population. We decided in 18 um, to look at other different mechanisms and ways to build new high schools. The Highland Springs High School wouldn't be here if it was for uh, population alone. So that is an equity decision. Renovation projects, Chamberlain, Adams, debt service from meals tax, 137 meals tax projects totaling $20 million for Fairfield and Verona districts alone in the past five years. And I could go on to talk about the Achievable Dream and the Gifted Young Scholar Program at Wilder and um, STEAM programs, talk about the 360 new students over a five-year period, and we've had hired 423 new positions. I understand that there, I'm a black man, I understand the inequity 
conversation. I've been in East and Rico for well over half of my life. So, so I get the perception of inequity over the years. But over the past few years, this county um, has not operated in a spirit of inequity from a capital perspective. I think what we need to work on are things that um, you heard uh, Assistant Chief Tony talk about earlier, which is culture and what we teach in the classroom, what we teach in as it relates to curriculum, um, how we treat each other. I think those are the things that I think also will help build for a more equitable community. But I just want to go on and, and share because there are many PowerPoints and presentations. I saw one of the pieces on Instagram. It said if you wanted to judge how the county thinks about the East End, then ride past Deep Run and ride past Mills Godwin or some other school, and then go look at Highland Springs and around. And clearly, that's somebody who hadn't been in the East End in some years. Because if you ride past the new Highland Springs, Deep Run and Mills Godwin would probably feel jealous. So I just want to make sure that I put that out on record um, that as it relates to the capital improvement program in Henrico County, the school board and the board of supervisors, um, I think, have been trying their best to create a more equitable environment in the county. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. And I would might agree with pretty much everything you said. Uh, agree with everything you said. Uh, it as as a light note, uh, we joke and kid all the time about how Brooklyn and Three Chop and Tuckahoe's libraries are near what the libraries are in, in Verona and Fairfield. So uh, thank you for bringing that forward. Is there anyone else with any other comments? None. Uh, so there was the, before. Uh, school board chairman and I talked and there was some concern that you know this was some sort of meeting that was not going to be in a positive I've been asking since last first year that we as a board and if you if you look the way we're sitting there's no two boards for one county so in closing to ask both manager and administrator that we go forward, maybe three or four months from now, sit down because we are one county. And the more we we talk, we you know we have questions every day. I, I can call Mickey and ask her, and, and but the more we work together, the stronger we are. So I'd like as we close out. And I'll ask any other comments, but as we close out, because we have to go do the other thing now, um, as, as we close out, please, school board and, and general government board supervisors, uh, please consider if we can do this quarterly, uh, uh, whatever. But I, I think it's healthy for our county to sit down together. Are there any other comments, questions? Anyone? All right, well, then I'm going to put us in recess so we can get over and, and do another meeting. Hey, Mr. Chairman, before you, before you hit that, can, can we do one thing while we have an opportunity in public to, um, the first time we have an opportunity in public, and I think we might have another opportunity coming up, but let's do it every time. And that I want to say thank you to Chief Cardinal, 32 years of public service. So I want to say thanks to both staff from general government and from the schools for putting this together. This is no easy task for anyone that's tried to get all 10 of us in one spot at one time and, and everything set up. on time. Yeah, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, and the only other thing I'll offer is this is this is good. And I, I'm willing to do this anytime we possibly can. I know it's hard to get together, but you know, uh, I, I want to shout out my counterpart for the hour long conversations that we get to have on the phone regularly. Um, but I know you all are doing that with each other. So let's continue to do that. Um, I think Panera will be happy to get our dollars back when we can meet in person there again. Um, but this conversation is good for us. Um, I think that there's more to be had. Mr. Nelson touched on a few things at the end. I, I, we could talk about these things for, for days. And, and it's only good for us to do so. So I just want to say thank you to each of you for the time.
Mr. Chairman, thank you. Anything from Tucker? Anything? No, I have Marcy on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mrs. O'Bain and I have had some fantastic conversations <laughs> over these last few weeks, um, but I just, you know, this was great in getting together and having a chance to have a collective conversation. Um, Ms. Ms. O'Bain and I have been building our relationship and our communication as well, but I would say, you know, we don't have to have a big official meeting for someone to to reach across the district and ask a question of their counterpart on the other government side. Um, so let's, you know, let's continue these to build these relationships and uh, work together for the best of our county. Fantastic. Thank you, Marcy. Okay. All right. Well, we are now in, in recess.